Welcome to the College Football Survivor Show, where playoff survival is always on the line. Here are your co-hosts, Doug Maurice and Shahan Jeharaja. And back on College Football Survivor Show, Shahan, you and I going in the Wayback Machine again for a reason. It's a playoff show we do here. We are putting a lot of things in context of the looming 12-team playoff that is on the horizon for 2024. We did previously teams of the current playoff era who would have been helped by a 12-team playoff. And we really dug in on some things of, you know, the Georgia era and uh, how we might have viewed some teams in the Pac-12 and that kind of thing. Now we're going back to the BCS era, 1998 to 2013, that period. What teams from then would have been helped the most by a 12-team playoff? Now, you know, 17-minute discussion about 1999 Team X when a bunch of our listeners weren't even, weren't even alive. Eh, less interesting. So we want to draw some conclusions here. It's not the first time that people have done this, but we're a playoff show, and we need to contextualize it for ourselves. You're going to guide us through this conversation, Shahan. When you think about the teams of the BCS era that would have been helped the most by a 12-team playoff, who do you go to first? Well, I resent that idea that uh, that we can't go back to 1998 because we will absolutely go back to 1998 at some points. We won't start there, though. You have to start with the team that I think made it unpalatable to not have a four-team playoff and to not have more teams involved in that discussion. And that's 2011 Oklahoma State. Uh, 2011 Oklahoma State, of course, was undefeated until they weren't, well, until they lost on a very controversial field goal that, if you ask people from Stillwater, was not good, went over the goalpost, but that's a that's a discussion for another day. And uh, they missed out on the playoff. And we got a rematch instead of Alabama versus LSU in that 2011 National Championship game. LSU beat Alabama during the regular season. They lost the rematch in the national title game. Everybody kind of threw up their hands and was like, why did we do this? What was the point of this? Why did we have to watch this game again? When there are are so many teams that Alabama and LSU didn't get to play along the way who maybe deserved a chance. I I think that you look at this team. This is really a such a fun team in hindsight, right? Justin Blackman was one of the best receivers that we had seen in a long, long time in college football. And if he didn't derail his, his career with some issues at the NFL level, like maybe he could have been one of the greats. Brandon Whedon was this like, I guess he was like my age, right? He was like 29 playing quarterback at Oklahoma State because he had a uh, he had a baseball career before he ever came. Joseph Randall was a 1200 yard rusher. Like this was this was a peak Mike Gundy team, and they deserved their shot. And I think that uh, that if they had gotten that shot, not only would we be talking about Oklahoma State differently. I mean, again, we keep coming back to this, right? Maybe realignment goes differently as well. Mike Gundy and Oklahoma State. He's been there almost two decades now. In a 12-team playoff world the whole time, Mike Gundy has at least two playoff appearances, maybe four. They have had a roadblock with Oklahoma, but this season that you're talking about in 2011, they beat Oklahoma. The week after this overtime Iowa State loss, they beat Oklahoma handily. They're awesome. They're number two in the country going to this Iowa State game. And I do think it's possible that when we talk about shifts, I'll just tell you, I'm up here in Ohio. Mike Gundy is not somebody that diehard Ohio State, diehard Big Ten, diehard national college football fans. I love college football. What do you think of Mike Gundy? I don't think people have an opinion on Mike Gundy. This has been an excellent college football program that has just never had that opportunity in the spotlight, Shahan. This would have been it. There would have been others. And I think to start here, this is a perfect encapsulation of the kind of very good football program that doesn't need help. It doesn't need help other than a little expansion of the structure. And even within that, like, what are we doing? We're not only rematching two SEC teams, we're rematching two SEC teams from the same division. Two SEC teams that played a 9-6 double overtime game that year that nobody wanted to see repeated, that was foisted upon us anyway. Oklahoma State didn't do anything wrong other than, like, lose a tough game on the road that was controversial. 
They just needed a little bit of like less SEC bias in the view of there's 10 different things that if one thing would have gone their way, Oklahoma State might have a national title right now. Right. Right. They, they at least would have had that moment. And I, I, I think this could be if you said like the type of program to be most helped by the 12 team playoff, I think Oklahoma State stands up for a lot of those type of really good, but I've never gotten over the top programs that have been in some ways denied their opportunity by the context and structure of the sport. No doubt. And, you know, one thing to mention about that Iowa State loss is like that was a very difficult game. Iowa State wasn't good that year, not for that from that perspective, but that same week, Oklahoma State's women's basketball coach was killed in a plane crash. And so it was like a very like cloud hanging over campus sort of situation. And so it's like, you're telling me that like a field goal that may or may not have been good in this like super difficult moment is like the thing that maybe has like screwed the future of Oklahoma State. That's crazy, right? Like that that these moments came down to this and that they were like, well, I guess we're going to have a rematch instead in the national title game. Like that sort of thing is crazy. It, it's, it just is like unfathomable at this point. And so, like you said, one like one tenth of one percent of something needs to go differently and Oklahoma State is playing for a national championship. And at this time, I absolutely think that Oklahoma State would have been capable of winning a national championship. Right. The sport has obviously shifted. We have sort of this uh, this whole Georgia situation now and and the Ohio State and Alabama situation wasn't really the case the same way back in 2011. And certainly I think another part of this that's interesting is that if Oklahoma State doesn't lose that game. Alabama's not in the national title game. And how does that change the Nick Saban dynasty, right? Because that, w- that was his second. They went on to win their third in 2012. And maybe that would have happened and it would have just been their second. And it doesn't really change anything other than that. But I don't know. It's really interesting. By the way, one thing. Do you remember who the offensive coordinator on this Oklahoma State team was? I don't. Who was it? It was Todd Monken. Oh, my gosh. Todd, man, come on. We would have had the, the, the Monken's on ro- long before. Yeah. This if they had had this opportunity. And it really is. I mean, you look at like that LSU team that they would have played because LSU had beaten Alabama during the regular season. LSU was undefeated. It would have been LSU, Oklahoma State. That's an LSU team. It, like, who is it? Ruben Randall is their leading receiver. Like, he's good. He's not Jamar Chase, right? Michael Ford and Spencer Ware are the leading rushers. I mean, it's not, this is not like a, um, Od- Odell Beckham is on that team, but as a younger guy, He's their second leading receiver. This is not like this is not the type of SEC team that Oklahoma State would have been like, well, they would have gotten there. They wouldn't, wouldn't have had right. a chance. And so that changes the entire history of that program. And it does remind and there are times that it's really tough when you have a roadblock, when you have a rival roadblock and you get over that roadblock and then it's something else that gets in your way. That Oklahoma, like what's Mike Gundy against Oklahoma? He has like three or four wins, yeah, right? It's, in 18 it's like seasons. three and 12, three and like 15. It's not good. So like this is one of those, they pounded. They won by four touchdowns the next week against Oklahoma. And like this is the thing right. that holds you back. That's what's so difficult. And I do think that you, it's an interesting point here. And again, the people who live through this, nobody, as much as the SEC was starting to dominate college football already, obviously by that point in 2011, nobody wanted to see LSU Alabama because it was it was a defensive conference. It was a two defensive programs. Nobody wants to see a rematch of that, and it was forced upon everybody. And then the team that lost in the regular like it's a back it's such a backdoor Bama title that nobody wanted. And I do think right this is it it starts it. It's like, let's not let this happen again. But Oklahoma State, I mean, I don't know what you would, if you sat and had a 90-minute conversation with Mike Gundy about how would your life be different? How would your program be different? How would your recruiting be different? I don't don't even know that, I'm not even sure he could describe it because what would prevent Oklahoma State from being one of the five best programs in the country right now? Like, why, why couldn't they be? If they had had a moment like that, or at least maybe why couldn't they be LSU? That LSU is not constantly the national title picture, but their peaks get national titles, right? Like they're up there, then they, you know, they have three or four losses and they're up there again. 
Um, and Oklahoma State has but just been much more of that than people realize. I really feel bad. I don't like I have <laughs> I this is making me sad. Yeah. Because this program's so good and people don't realize it. No, and I think I think the other part of this is like you said, we exist in this age in 2023 where there's an inevitability to what the SEC is. There's an inevitability to what Ohio State is. Uh, you know, and, and I think that we just have to go back to that moment and remember that this was not predetermined. This was not predestined. Uh, you know, Oklahoma State is a couple hours from one of the biggest recruiting hubs in the country, right? In DFW. Like, it's not like they couldn't have gotten access to talent. What ended up flipping is that Alabama then goes on to be the IT program and kind of comes in and, uh, and and starts recruiting nationally in a different kind of way, right? So, like, this stuff wasn't a guarantee. And if in 2011 things change, you know, you never know what's going to happen. Uh, and, yeah, do you think that Brandon Whedon could have outdueled Jarrett Lee and Jordan Jefferson? I, I yeah. think he probably i think he probably could have guys i i think that i think that uh that justin blackman guy would have been okay going up against reuben randall on the other side i think it would have been fine so that's a that's a sad game that we didn't get to get and like you said the lsu and alabama those years were very much defensive teams and so i would have loved to see the best offense in the country yes. by a good margin go up against one of the best defenses in the country I will say, whenever you keep saying Brandon Whedon's name in this discussion, it is very difficult for somebody in Ohio <laughs> to like get past that discussion. It's tough for people in Dallas, too. Trust me. He's a first round pick of the Browns. And I can remember there's a there's a golf tournament in Columbus, the Memorial Golf Tournament. They just had it. Uh, Jack Nicholas's tournament in Columbus. And I don't cover it anymore, but I covered it back then when he was a draft pick of the Browns. And when he was new to the Browns, he was Brandon Whedon was walking around with Ricky Fowler, who's also from Oklahoma State yeah, at the yeah. memorial. And Brandon Whedon was clad from head to toe in orange. I think Ricky Fowler was too. <laughs> and it was like, look at this big guy in orange walking around at the memorial. And it was, I was there for my Cleveland newspaper writing about golf. But my number one story that day was talk to Brandon Whedon about walking around in orange clothing with his Oklahoma State friend. Imagine if he was walking around with a big old national title ring on his finger. Oh, <laughs> could have changed his career. It, yeah. You would have, you know, when the Browns drafted, it was like, okay, they drafted like a 25-year-old college quarterback. What are they doing? If he's a national championship quarterback, then did, didn't he get, he got, smothered by an american flag in the pregame one time at a browns game i think that happened to brandon <laughs> Whedon. they rolled the flag over it did, him it did like he just all the things that happened to brandon Whedon. if they would have been happening with a national championship ring on it just changes how every because by the time he got here i don't want to it's kind of a big goofball he's kind of a big old goofball <laughs> he can throw but it's like i don't know how good is he he could have been a national champ man you know the funny thing is no i did i did check his age do you know how old he was when he was drafted i think was he 25 or 24 no he was 28 and he turned 29 during his first season in the nfl that is unbelievable that's how old i am right now i haven't been in college for like eight years <laughs> that's crazy that is unbelievable and so so look i understand how it makes cleveland people feel but you should have told your front office to not draft a 29 year old quarterback that's on you <laughs> but, i know it's, but uh but you know like and brandon Weed wasn't even a, a bad nfl player either right like he was he was solid it just they picked him in the first round i don't know why they did that should we run through all the other bad browns quarterback draft picks <laughs> yeah 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 let's uh let's, let's change up this yeah. uh let's derail this <laughs> Hey, we can throw Robert Griffin on that list. Another 2011 Big 12 quarterback. So let's have a conversation. I said I want you to guide us, but I want to connect two teams here because okay. it is, it's fascinating, the evolution. And, and one of the things that, in going through this exercise, again, 16 years of the BCS, I thought there were seven years where just having two teams play for the national title made total sense. I thought there were six years that were abject disasters because of the structure, and there were three that were kind of in between. So you would go through situations like, well, I don't know. There's clearly two best teams, and they played each other. Do we need a 12-team playoff? And then you'd get to the next thing and be like, I can't believe it took them this long to get to a 12-team playoff. How did people not set the sport on fire for a 12-team playoff? 
And the, the difference between 2011, when basically the sport is like, I don't know, just two SEC teams, even if neither of them are that good, is that okay with everybody? And everybody's like, no. And the sport says, we're doing it anyway. That's 2011. 2004, the idea that an undefeated SEC team would be left out of the national championship game, it feels like we're on another planet. I can't believe the SEC didn't pick up and move to Antarctica and be like, we are out of, we're not doing this anymore. The modern SEC, Greg Sankey would pull all of his bowl teams off the field. They would secede from the NCAA. An undefeated SEC team is left out, but that's what happens with 2004 Auburn behind USC and Oklahoma. And it just tells you, we weren't yet. Seven years later, it's all about the SEC. Seven years previously in 04, we weren't there yet. And that idea now, it's so you cannot wrap your head around it. And so you wind up feeling bad. We have to talk about 2004 Auburn, but it's Auburn. What are we doing? How did this ever happen, Sean? No, this this one was definitely on my list. Uh, again, an undefeated SEC team, not making the national championship game, finishing the season undefeated, not really having a legitimate claim to a national championship. Unbelievable stuff. Like I, I you can't wrap your head around it as, as obviously somebody who kind of really came of age when they went to college in the early 2010s. Like it just, it's unbelievable. And look at the rest of that year too, right? Obviously Auburn's the big one because USC and Oklahoma who were both undefeated made the national championship game. Auburn finishes third. Utah finishes undefeated that year. Texas is 11 and 1. Louisville's 11 and 1. Boise State's 11 and 1. And none of these teams had any ability to play even close to a national championship. That's, that's unbelievable, right? And that's, this is one of these perfect seasons that I talk about where I know that some people come at it from the opposite perspective. But for me, if there's a team that has a legitimate case and legitimately deserves to play for a national championship, I'm willing to allow some teams that quote unquote might not belong in order to let the legitimate teams in because we're setting a baseline of, you know, if, if there are in the biggest year, eight teams that maybe deserve to play for a national championship, like we got to make sure they're in. We can't have these seasons where Utah and Boise state and, you know, obviously Texas got their shot the next year, but like most teams don't get their shot the next year. That's not usually how it works. And uh, Auburn though, of course, clearly the number one, uh, you know, biggest team that was screwed by this process on this list. So these, these were the sec coaches in the 2004 season. Tommy Tuberville was at Auburn. Mark Richt at Georgia, Phil Fulmer at Tennessee. Nick Saban was in his last year at LSU before he went to the NFL. Ron Zook at Florida, Lou Holtz at, Holtz at South Carolina, Mike Shula at Alabama, Houston Nutt at Arkansas, David Cutcliffe at Old Miss, Sylvester Croom at Mississippi State, Rich Brooks at Kentucky, Bobby Johnson at Vanderbilt. So, first of all, it's a reminder, the SEC wasn't always the SEC. This is not how it's always been in college football. To me, and I've I've talked about this many times. Everybody knows this. The shift is 2006, Ohio State, Alabama, excuse me, Ohio State, Michigan, play a 1-2 game at the end of the 2006 season. Ohio State beats Michigan. Some people think, hey, they're the two best teams. They should rematch in a national championship game. It doesn't happen. Instead, we get Ohio State, Florida, Urban Meyer in Florida beat Ohio State. Nick Saban arrives in the SEC the next year, and we're off to the races. And this sport has shifted, and it's never shifted back. The Big Ten is now closer than it was, but still in 2004, it's not 100 years ago. It's less than two decades, fewer than two decades ago, Shahan, that the power in the sport was not concentrated in the SEC. And it, this is the proof, because if the power was there, it would have been exerted in a way that no. it's like, well, who's going to get in? Well, let me tell you who's getting in. There's three undefeated teams. First, the SEC team's getting in, and then the rest of the world can fight it out. And it was not viewed that way. There was a lot of power in the Big Ten. There was a lot of power with what Pete Carroll was doing at USC. And it's fascinating to remember that. And the idea of, of what fuels change, right? I'm not, a, we're not going to sit here and be experts on this and have a 90 minute discussion on this, but you know, 
You have an undefeated team and you don't even get a shot at a national title. And there's all this talent in the South. It's like, okay, well, that's never going to happen again. And then here we go. 2004, right? Nick Saban's at LSU. He has his share of a national title at LSU. He's about to leave the SEC. And Urban Meyer's not there yet. Ron Zook got fired at the end of this season. Urban Meyer's coming. But it's this new era that's on the horizon. And for a place where football matters so much, I, it, the idea of like, this is intolerable. We can't, this can't be this. We need to be the centerpiece of the college football universe because that Auburn team was good, man. They should have been in the mix. No, they should have been. And again, in a future season, of course, Auburn would be in the mix. I, I think that this is just one of those years that shows the necessity of not just a four team, but I think more than that. Cadillac Williams, Ronnie Brown in the backfield, right? Two huge NFL draft picks. Uh, Jason Campbell at quarterback goes on to a long NFL career. It's like a real team. So anyway. Uh, and and led by, of course, a United States senator from Alabama. Yeah. I think that's why he's in the Senate. Yeah. He's still mad that Auburn <laughs> was he's like, I'll show you. I'll be a senator. So um, the idea, it's just, it's just, you can't, you can't wrap your head around it. And again, people listening to this know this, but we're trying to, like, you can't, I think right now, right, that US, that's USC, right? USC is rolling then. Like this is, but I'm not so sure, like you put those teams in a 12 team playoff, Auburn might be like the betting favorite. I don't know. Like you're talking about the talent, like this is, this is that world. So anyway. We're talking about Oklahoma State in 2011, Auburn in 2004. Who else are we talking about that would have been helped by a 12-team playoff? We'll do it next on the College Football Survivor Show. The College Football Survivor Show, where playoff survival is always on the line. All right, Jahan, so 11 and 04, two of my six years that were disasters. Where do you else do you want to take us? Who should we talk about next? Do you want to talk about the disaster of a year? Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about 2007. Yeah. 2007 is one of, I mean, I I think that people talk about it as the craziest football season of our lifetime. And I think they're probably right. We had a two loss team win the national championship in LSU. Les Miles winning his lone national championship. But the amount of teams that had a chance to be there is frankly unbelievable. Like, it it is frankly unbelievable. Obviously, people might remember that historic West Virginia versus Pitt game where West Virginia screwed their chance of making the the BCS National Championship game by losing to a horrendous Pitt team. People might also remember the famous Kansas versus Missouri game earlier in the year. Both of them went on to win 12 games. This was uh, the year that Kansas won the Orange Bowl as as a one-loss team. Like... This is such a weird, crazy year. And ultimately, you know, we do get uh, a two-loss team again in the national championship game. And so there's so much subjectivity when it comes to that. Now, LSU ended up winning the thing. Of course, it makes people feel better about the fact that the right team came through. But you're telling me that Missouri couldn't have gone on a run with Chase Daniel. You're, you're telling me that that uh, West Virginia didn't deserve their chance, right? They ended up finishing number six in the country. I don't know. Like, this is a year where you have to let them decide it on the field. There was no team that clearly deserved to be in over the other. So I was right in the middle of covering that because Ohio State winds up as the number one team going in. Like, at the end of the final BCS rankings, there was a one-loss Ohio State that had lost to Illinois in the second-to-last game of the regular season. They won at Michigan and the Ohio State players were climbing in the stands with roses in their mouths because they were going to the Rose Bowl. It's like, well, they're out of the national title race because the Big Ten season ended so early back then. It's like they're going to the Rose Bowl. And then all it's like, well, it's like seven different things had to happen. And they all happened. And Ohio State winds up not just in, but they're number one. And two loss LSU is number two. The teams that I really feel bad for in this situation is Missouri and Kansas are, I believe, number two and number four when they play their rivalry game. Kansas is number two. Missouri is number four. Kansas is undefeated going into that game. Missouri wins that game 36-28. Kansas gets behind and rallies at the end and doesn't happen. And then Missouri goes on and loses in the Big 12 title game to Oklahoma. So the result is that the Big 12 doesn't get anything. 
when actually all three of those teams should have been in a 12-team playoff. Right. And the result of that Kansas-Missouri game is it's the biggest game in the history of that rivalry. We think that Lance Leipold has come back and re- re- revived Kansas and that Kansas – this was – yeah. Like we went crazy because Lance Leipold won six games last year at Kansas. Yep. Yep. Kansas was number two. They were 11-0. and 0. Yep. And the result is you lose one game to your rival and then it gets a little sideways because your conference is good and you get nothing. You get nothing. And why shouldn't Kansas or Missouri or why shouldn't one of those Big 12 teams been in ahead of Ohio State? Why did Ohio, why did Ohio State have to be there? Ohio State was in the national title game the year before. They lost at home to Illinois. What right? And they don't even have a championship game. All the times when it's like later, once we get to the playoff, the Big 12 gets the the wrong end of the stick because they don't have a a championship game. Now they do have a championship. If the Big 12 doesn't have a championship game, the winner of Missouri, Kansas is in the BCS title game. Instead, the winner of that game has the opportunity to go lose to Oklahoma in the Big 12 title game. So nobody gets in. Ohio yep. State doesn't have to go. It's horror. And what would it have done? When is the last? Would Missouri be in the SEC? What can you imagine if you could have built something around? Okay, this is the new era of the Missouri Kansas football rivalry. Instead, that rivalry's dead. And this was its peak. And and the result was they got nothing out of it. It was a great game. Chase Daniel threw for 360 yards. Missouri wins. They get nothing out of it. I feel like one of the things going through this list and and putting together sort of the teams that I would point out is that it was just so freaking Big 12 heavy. Like the Big 12 is the most would have, could have, should have conference in maybe all of college sports because not only do you have the Missouri-Kansas thing, you have West Virginia this year who, frankly, should have played for a national championship if they don't mess things up. Uh, you know, I mean, we'll get to them in a second. The amount of times that TCU should have had a chance in the BCS era is just unbelievable. Oklahoma State in 2011, another team that we're going to talk about back in 1998, it's Kansas State under Bill Snyder, who also, by the way, loses a conference championship game to cost themselves a chance at the national championship. like. Holy crap. The Big 12 is like like millimeters away from being something crazy and instead now they're like fighting for survival. It is it is like truly unbelievable how much they've been screwed by this process. And it's and it's difficult because once you get these perceptions, I don't want to say biases. I want to say perceptions and yeah. reputations established. It creates a world where once a conference, the SEC, gets a reputation as a strong conference, then you can survive a loss. But if you are a another conference that doesn't have that reputation, but actually might have more good teams at the top of the conference, like this Missouri, Kansas, Oklahoma year, you don't get the same credit. And if you knock each other off, you knock each other out. And we're even talking about that. This might be what the Pac-12 does this year. The Pac-12's reputation perception is not good right now but when you think about okay could could you create a pac-12 scenario this season that resembles missouri kansas oklahoma in 2007 absolutely we're going to talk we're going to get washington usc utah and nobody gets in but they might be three of the best seven teams and they'd all easily be in a 12 team playoff this is the kind of thing where instead of celebrating the strength of the Big 12 that year and it becoming this is one of those things right this is this is a Shahan kind of this is Shahan feel good time welcome to Shahan feel good time at its best college football should be a regional sport where the strength of your region makes you feel proud makes you feel excited about the regional aspect of your sport and then when it's time to go national the strength of your region is a plus not a minus And now you go out and represent your region and all the regions are represented and you find out, okay, we all beat each other up, but we're going to have multiple representatives in. Let's do this thing instead of a world where you live in your own little bubble 
nobody has the right context. Everybody assumes the SEC is better than the Big 12, but we don't get to figure it out. Missouri assumes it. Why is it Missouri assumes it? Because they leave to go to the SEC. But what if the Big 12 could have been this? I'm sad again. I'm sad. <laughs> no, and and it is sort of a oh. situation where it's like, again, in 2011, you have this perception of the SEC. And so it means that the subjectivity puts LSU and Alabama as the top two teams. Whereas, again, even if you want to look back at a 14 playoff year in 2014, you know, we have the situation where the number five and number six team in the entire country are both in the same conference and neither get in, you know? So it's like, it, it's just, this stuff matters. And one of the things that, that, that's one of the things that I like so much about the 12 team playoff is, for example, when you look at the Pac-12 this year, there are five teams that I think have a legitimate chance to win the Pac-12 and have a legitimate chance to compete for the playoff. And if you had to make me bet right now, I'd bet zero of them make the field because of what you just said. And that is a tragedy. That That is a that is messed up. That is not how it should be. You should get credit for beating you know, three of the other teams and then losing two along the way that you should get credit for that. And you should get your chance to play at the top. And we've reached a point so much where the idea of success is, well, it's whoever has a one at the end of their record. And if you have a one or if you have a zero, then you're in. And if not, you don't. And it just misses so much context. So I'm, I'm really excited about the fact that we will actually get to credit teams for going through and winning their conference and uh, and put them up against the rest of the world for everybody to see. 2007, if Kansas wins that game, if Kansas wins that game, Kansas is in the national title game. <laughs> they lose it. They go eight and five the next year, and they yeah. haven't had a winning record since. Yep. 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 And it's such a peak. And they had losing records so often previous to it. This is a Mark Mangino peak. Do you think? And it's one of those things that, again, We'll have to see what happens at TCU. It could have been a TCU situation the way it worked, right? That maybe they do get in, and then it turns out they go and they play Ohio State or they play LSU, and they get the doors blown off. And and we'll have to see what TCU in the long haul gets out of making the national title game last year against Georgia. I think we've already discussed on this pod that we already think people view it wrong. That it feels like they get more like, oh, man, they proved they weren't as good as Georgia. And it's like, you realize they were second to Georgia. That yeah. should be a celebration. We already have the wrong view. But if Kansas had got – would Kansas fundamentally be a different program? Now, the Mangino era went off a cliff. But could, could you have established something there? Or was this going to be a very short period peak? regardless or could they have built something more on it if there had been an opportunity for them to a have a better chance of getting in a national title game with a little leeway or as you've talked about before having the opportunity to win a game or two in a playoff situation where just that opportunity okay well we can we can beat an eight seed we don't have to just only play georgia right away what would it have meant for kansas football no it's it's a really good question and i think you know, to go back to just for one second of the TCU thing, have we forgotten that they beat Michigan? I feel like we we just like ignore that they beat Michigan. But anyway, that's beside the point. You know, Kansas in that season was obviously like so. So what they did was they were very much an air raid team. Mark Mangino came off of that Mike Leach tree. He was a offensive coordinator at Oklahoma before that. And they got a quarterback from Texas named Todd Reesing who actually played at the same high school as Baker Mayfield, Lake Travis. He was like the original Lake Travis quarterback uh, who played as part of that system. And it, it just worked. You know, it just worked. So I think the big question for Kansas after this would have been, when you're not the innovator, could you keep it up? Right, because that's that's what Kansas was doing that year. But the flip side of that is if they make the national title game and I mean, for goodness sake, if they win a national championship, which I think, again, LSU ended up winning as a two loss team. This was not some sort of huge guarantee that like that they would have not been able to hang or anything. I, again, we, we don't live, I don't think, in the 2022 football season back in 2007. I think that Kansas absolutely could have hung. I, 
I think that that changes the way that Kansas views its own football program and the way that it invests in its own football program. And, you know, up until like three years ago, Kansas played in a stadium that had a track around it. Right. That's not the case. If Kansas wins a national championship in 2007, that investment comes sooner. Um, I, I think that money comes in a different way. Obviously, look, Kansas has this disadvantage. And, and I think there are other programs maybe in the Big Ten that, you know, you look at a Kentucky and the SEC. Like basketball is going to come first. They win the basketball national championship in 2008. And so that that's still going to happen. They're still going to invest in that way. And Kansas football is still going to be secondary. But I do think that that speeds things along. I do think that maybe we see a program that maybe in a way looks more like Kansas State, uh, maybe like 2010's Kansas State. So maybe not one that's competing at the highest level, but one that has seasons where they have a chance. And instead, we get one of the most neglected programs in all of college football over the last 15 years. Uh, okay. <sighs> That's a good comparison because you like you love Kansas State. I love Kansas State. You yeah. love Kansas State. Kansas State has a lot to hold on to. Yeah. Kansas State's not Alabama, but Kansas State has a lot to be proud of. And Kansas has been mucking around, waiting for Lance Leipold to get in the 500. And just imagine what they could have been. What if they had been putting together eight win seasons for the last 20 years instead of three win seasons? Thanks a lot, college football. All right. Who else? <laughs> who else could have used 12 teamer? Well, I, I mean, we mentioned them. I feel like I have to to say something. Um, so 1998 Kansas State. This is Bill Snyder's best team. This is Michael Bishop. This is uh, an incredible staff. This is the peak, I think, in a lot of ways of what Bill Snyder is. They go in to, again, the conference championship game with a, with one loss, I believe, at that time. No, actually, no, they were undefeated. They were undefeated heading into the conference championship game against Texas A&M. They lay an egg, losing double overtime to Texas A&M. By the way, Texas A&M's only conference championship since the Southwest Conference folded. But, that, you know, I'm just saying. Uh, and so Kansas State misses out on the chance to play for a national championship. And by the way, if you have any questions about how good this Kansas State team was, the second that Bob Stoops gets the Oklahoma job in 1999, he basically hires away half of Bill Snyder's staff, including a young assistant named Brent Venables, including Mike Stoops. Like, this is a cataclysmic event for Kansas State and their opportunity to compete at the highest level year in and year out because this was the team, this was the staff, this was the moment. And yeah, they just completely got screwed. And also, by the way, they got left out of the BCS as well. They played in the Alamo Bowl at the end of the year. So, like, this was just, it was a double overtime loss to Texas A&M. That was it. And they go from clearly playing for a national championship. They would have played uh, Tennessee that year. Right, Tennessee was 1998? Yes. Uh, yes. Instead, they play in the Alamo Bowl. And it's just against unranked Purdue. And they don't show up because obviously they should have been playing for a national championship and they lose that game. So, like. Come on, <laughs> you know, it, this is this is the peak of Bill Snyder. I remember uh, a couple of years ago, there was somebody who got uh, on Twitter who got ratioed to hell because they were like, was Bill Snyder even like that good? Why do we talk about him like this? And it's like, because because he didn't have like a nominal top five finish. And it's like, dude, this this 1998 Kansas State team was ridiculous. This was so much better than any football team at Kansas State had the right to be and they lost in double overtime. They missed their chance. They didn't even get a chance to to play in a BCS bowl. And it just set the program back for several years. So th this is a good example because this is a year. Tennessee is the only undefeated team. And there are teams two through five all have one loss. And it's like, how do you pick? And I think you wind up picking. And again, there's computers involved. But I do think you wind up picking on reputation in a world where the other three teams needed it more. So Florida State gets the shot. Florida State has a September loss to North Carolina State. It's like, oh my gosh. Well, should that be disqualifying? Not necessarily, but also, come on. Florida State lost to North Carolina State. The other three major teams that are 3-4-5 in the final BCS standings are Kansas State, as you just described, Ohio State, and UCLA. So UCLA is set up to make the BCS. They lose their last regular season game at Miami. 
and they get taunted leaving the field. And like UCLA blows it. What if UCLA sure has a national championship shot, right? And Ohio State, you know, Ohio State's Ohio State now, but this is the John Cooper era. Can't beat Michigan. He's 210 and one against Michigan in his 13 year career. They beat Michigan this year, but they had already lost to Michigan State and Nick Saban. And so that opportunity, and and then Coop, uh, John Cooper had a lot of trouble in bowl games. They go on and beat Florida State in their bowl game. So, like, this is the year. All the things John Cooper didn't did it, do at Ohio State, win bowl games, beat Michigan. He did in 98. He just got upset by Nick Saban and Michigan State. So to go in, instead, you create a situation where you're, ta- you're flipping a four-sided coin to choose between Florida State, Kansas State, Ohio State, UCLA, when in a 12-team playoff, it is on. It is on. They're not perfect, but they're really good. All these teams are really good. And it's just such a missed opportunity. This is one of those, okay, you could, again, we're talking about the big 12 teams we feel bad for, but like I feel bad for the sport. Sure. That's a part of this. That Like, who's the loser? The sport. Yeah. We would have been, can you imagine, it's like, oh man, think about, we might get that, UCLA Kansas State quarterfinal. That's going to be awesome. Sure. They're two great teams. Both of them have a chance to change the entire future and perception of the football program. And instead, it's like, oh, you go to the Alma Bowl. It's like, what are we doing? Why did it take us this long? And I do think in the end, and people listening to this know this, we are trying to remind you depth of talent, strength of conferences, all those things shouldn't hurt you. They should embolden you. They should excite you. And we, this is finally the sports getting to this spot. Instead, Florida State just goes and loses to T. Martin in Tennessee. Tennessee wins the national championship. Congratulations. But you blew an opportunity for a humdinger of a December when you would have said, well, who's going to win the national title? Be like, I don't know. Like, like eight teams, I think, could win it. And that's, that's almost going to be difficult, Shahan, because the sport's consolidated. Are we going to have 12 team playoffs where when we when we legitimately think how many of these 12 can win it? And we'll be like, I don't know, like eight, nine, nine of them can. I have a feeling, especially early on, maybe until, you know, the the making the playoff pays off and, and maybe spreads the talent out a little bit more. I do think we missed the era when a 12 team playoff would have meant a roll of the dice. And instead, it's going to be like, well, I still think it's going to be Georgia. They're just going to have to play more games. And the games will be good, and we're excited for it. But I don't know it'll be as wide open as 98, for instance, could have been. No, I and I don't think it will be, especially in these early years, like you mentioned, because we just have reached a level of consolidation that isn't normal, frankly. And so I do think that uh, that this is something that becomes an investment in this, the future of the sport, right? This isn't a conversation about the first two years of the playoffs. This is about 10, 20 years down the road. But – Again, the the way that college football is strongest in my eyes is you need to have this regionalism. You need to have representation of different parts of the country. One thing that I think that we need to talk about as like a sport is the fact that, yes, obviously the Pac-12 hasn't made the playoffs since 2016, but it also becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy when there's less investment and interest on the West Coast. Like this stuff matters. This college football is one of the sports where perception drives reality, maybe more than any other sport, because perception impacts uh, investment, impacts recruiting decisions, impacts uh, you know everything. And so I think that when we reach a point of of taking a step back and saying, "Hey, you know what? You can go to." Uh, to TCU and have a chance to play on the highest level. You can go to NC State and have a chance to play on the highest level. You can go to Oregon State maybe this upcoming year and have a chance to play on the highest level. That's good for the sport because the other part of this too is think about if you're a recruit making a decision, you almost have to make a decision between one, do I want to play at a school that I love and I feel like fits me? Or two, do I want to play at the school that matters that will play for a national championship. Cause if you want to do that, you have to go to like three schools right now, you know? So I, I'm, I'm curious and maybe this doesn't happen. Maybe we're too far gone. I don't know, but I do think that, uh, that it will make an impact. And I do think that again, like you said, the opportunity for some of these schools that we've mentioned to get into a playoff for, for Kansas football to get into a playoff, and use their exciting new innovative system. I think that you can also throw 2008 Texas Tech into this group as well, 
um, it, it's similar in a way, and say, go win a game. Go do something exciting that other teams can't hang with. And maybe you still lose at the very end, but but winning two games and then losing to the team that wins the national championship is really just not that big of a deal. It it just really isn't. All right. Couple more examples we want to get to. Man, we're we're fixing the sport. I feel good. Let's take a break and we'll come back on the College Football Survivor Show. The College Football Survivor Show, where playoff survival is always on the line. So Shahad, I'm old, I'm twice as old as you. And I covered college football enough that in part of the BCS era, that computers drove me nuts. And I thought bad votes by uneducated, biased pollsters drove me nuts. But it's a reminder of so much of the football was right. The conferences were right. The talent distribution was right. And we just were putting the national discussion in the hands of the wrong people. And I think it's a reminder that I do think the committee is much better than pollsters and computers. I do think 12 you know, that you have a bigger margin for error and it gets more teams in. And now the, the quote problem, as you said, is it's the same teams all the time. So can we get back to that? It's a reminder. We're giving you a reminder, whether you're an, error, an expert in the BCS era or not. There was a time not that long ago when, when you could have seasons like this where it, it wasn't the same teams all the time. And the rise of Georgia is new, right? Because it's, just not, it's not just Bama and Clemson and Oklahoma and Ohio State. And, and I do think, I don't think this era is dead. And if we can get back to sort of the the uh, the you know the, un- the uncertainty in a good way of like well, who's going to be good this year? I don't know. I mean there's some teams that are always around, but there's more teams that spring up and we just provide them a better structure. We absolutely could be heading into the best college football we've ever seen. Be excited about it. Because I I do think I don't think this has to be dead. I don't think the era of Missouri and Kansas State and UCLA and Texas Tech and Tennessee and Auburn and all those teams mattering. I don't think it has to be dead. I don't. And I do think the new structure can help us get back to that. All right. What's another team, another year you want to bring up? Well, uh, you know, people who who watch Oregon State football will remember a guy named Jonathan Smith because he happens to be the head coach right now at Oregon State University. But did you know that in 2000, he also quarterbacked maybe the best Oregon State team ever? To eleven and one, a number four final finish with two receivers. Uh, you heard of these guys, uh, Chad Johnson and TJ Hushmanzada? I, I think they were I pretty know. good. Yeah, you know, I think those guys are mm. pretty good. Um, so this this is an example, I think, of a culmination year not being rewarded in any meaningful way. Right? They finished number four in the country, and it's just like, oh, that's such a nice season for you. You get to play in a in a cool bowl game. But you don't get real national recognition. You know, you don't get really your shot to go and play against the best. And I think that this is the kind of team that you can look at in Oregon State. Maybe this year is is the year that Oregon State gets to do it. But, but you know, you have these examples, I think, of teams that go through their their process and eventually end up at a point where they have a culmination year where they have the end of a growth cycle. Because this was very much the end of a cycle. In 2001, they go five and six. It, it doesn't continue. But I think that it is a good thing that when teams have these upward swings, that we get to see them now on the national stage. This is really good. I think that's a great point, that we're talking about peaks of programs, but that the peaks previously had to be perfect peaks. Right. So they lose one game during the regular season and then it just turns into like nice year and exciting for the fans. They showed up every Saturday and they were rewarded with tremendous victories. We get that. But like from the bigger perspective. A peak isn't enough. And and 2000 is just a mess. Florida State loses to Miami on the field during the season. They both finish the regular season with, with one loss and the computers put Florida State in ahead of Miami. Miami's ahead in both polls. Florida State's ahead of the computer rankings. Like, what are we doing? How did it take another 13 years after this to get to a real playoff system? So this is just, and again, we're fighting over Miami versus Florida State with one loss, and the world was like, oh, Oregon State, you're fine. But like, you're not even really in the mix in the same way. 
and it's and why there's no reason for it i don't know did miami and florida state have tj hushmanzada and osho cinco on their team probably like like this is oregon state like you have to realize how good a team can be so i i think for oregon state like what we think about what oregon state is now now this makes me want to get jonathan smith on this podcast to talk about this right like what would it have been and that Jonathan Smith is back now to bring back that era of Oregon State, which was great, but was not rewarded in the same way. And so this is one more year. Oregon State, we throw them in the mix. Usually, I mean, it's like USC, Washington, Oregon, Utah, but Oregon State's there. It's just really a five-team discussion in the Pac-12. And they're still not going to be rewarded this year. But in the 12-team playoff, they will be. So I think this is a, this is a great one to bring up. And I think in the end, that point, like what do you – why the 12 teams? to reward the peaks so that your peak when you are not a tier one program, your peak gives you a chance at the playoff. I I think that is a very compelling point that your peak doesn't have to get you in the top two. It just has to get you in the top 12. And I think this is a perfect example. I don't know that you would present this again. It took me a while to get to come around on the 12 team playoff. If I was still four team Doug and you presented this to me, it's a very compelling case, Sean. <laughs> well, let me close with uh, this group of teams. And that is the collection of TCU, Boise State, and Utah in the 2000s. These are teams that go undefeated in the regular season a whole lot, beat some really big teams in major bowl games. Obviously, uh, Boise State, I believe, went undefeated twice. TCU in 2010, they they win the, the uh, Rose Bowl. They beat Wisconsin that year. Like, these teams didn't even get a sniff at getting to play for a national championship. They were not taken seriously, even though they continually went and beat top-end teams and top-level teams. And by the way, since they've moved conferences, TCU and Utah have done pretty dang well for themselves as well. So like, it, it's not like, and, and obviously difference in resources and all that sort of thing, but like, it's not like they're proving that they couldn't hang, right? It's not like they're showing that these were not serious programs. And, and the coaches at those times for Utah and TCU were obviously a big part of, uh, of their success when they moved conferences. Obviously TCU has since changed coaches to, to uh, Sonny Dykes, but Gary Patterson was a huge part of their success in the big 12 as well. So now in this system, again, we're taking away the subjectivity. We're taking away the the perspective. We're taking away the bias. We're taking away uh, perception. And six teams that are conference champions are going to get in. And I've pointed back to the 2020 season a lot because in 2020, we would have had two group of five teams among the top six conference champions. Not only would we have had Coastal Carolina Uh, But we also would have had, I believe it was Cincinnati that year. And so like these teams are going to get a chance to prove that they can do things on the highest level. Now, probably the sad part about this is that this is happening after the group of five has been gutted in some ways by the big 12. And so, you know, that's, that's unfortunate, but I'm excited to see a Boise state. I'm excited to see a Troy right now. I'm excited to see UTSA and SMU, those are two programs I'm going to be keeping a very close eye on in this expanded playoff and uh, and them getting their shot. Because again, you know, I remember one year TCU and Boise State were both right there at the very top. And I think they put them together. They paired them up in a BCS game. And it's like, what are you doing, guys? The point is that we want these teams to have an opportunity to play against the best and prove that they belong. And which which both programs did multiple times uh, during the the 2000s. Now we're virtually guaranteed that that's going to be the case. 2009 is is an example here. It's Alabama, Texas in the national title game. They're both undefeated. But Cincinnati, TCU and Boise State all are also undefeated that year. Right. And it's just not even I mean, it's not even a conversation. It's going to be Bama, Texas. Everybody knows it. And. I will say along the way, this has been a less compelling argument to to me when it's like, okay, well, you're undefeated, but like, come on, look at your schedule. There's a lot of teams, you know, if there's the the three or four best teams in most of the power five conferences would have gone undefeated against that schedule. Do you wish what you just said there? Do you like that TCU and Utah and now Houston and UCF and Cincinnati have stepped up or are stepping up into a quote power conference? 
or do you wish they had stayed put and that the sport had provided them the con like the underdogs aren't going to be the same kind of underdogs anymore. And when you have 69 teams in the top group and it's like, okay, well who's, who's going to be that 12, 11 or 12 seed that we talked about can be that Cinderella that can get the nation talking about, man, I can't believe that 12 beat that five, which again is such a big part of the NCAA basketball tournament. Do you, can you imagine if Utah was still that people, the five seed would be scared out of its mind. If Kyle Whittingham's waiting, it's like oh, that. If Sonny Dykes is waiting, do you wish that was still the case? Or is it a victory in itself that, that teams like TCU and Utah were so good that they, they earned in every way that jump up. And now it's not just that they're in these conferences is that we're t- Utah's, Won the last two Pac-12 titles. Utah's as good as any program in the Pac-12, and they haven't been in the Pac-12 that long. What's better, that they made the jump or that you wish they were still in smaller conferences? So I think that obviously we have to preface this conversation with the fact that it's frankly unpalatable for a team to not be in the Power Five at this point and compete at the highest level consistently because the gaps have just grown so much. Like the the difference in money is so vast at this point, right? The uh, the Big Twelve, you know, released their their distribution last week. It's forty four million. The the AAC distributes seven million. That's why the teams are moving, and we can be annoyed about it, we can be upset about it, but like that's reality, right? And so, I think that I like the idea of there being some legitimate legitimate contenders outside of the Power Five, and maybe Boise State down the road can still be that, although. Not loving everything about what they're doing right now, but that's a, that's another story. Uh, I do think that you know you look at a Tulane, you look at a Troy, you look at what Coastal Carolina has been. I'm going to be curious what Liberty is under Jamie Chadwell. So like, I think that there will be some spoilers still. I don't think that this has gone away, but certainly, you know, again, I think that you can make the case that 2010 TCU or 2009 Boise State could have won the national championship if they had the opportunity. That's not going to be the case. I mean, that's not going to be the case for, for at least two, probably, of the the middle three conferences, too. Like, like, I think that the sport is just stratified that much. But, you know, I mean, I, I definitely do think that, um, you know, I wasn't, I, I've been forward about this, like, in the 2000s when I was growing up, like, I was not the hugest college football fan. I really got into it when I came to college in 2012. And so... You know, but it's it's hard not to look back at some of that era with some nostalgia and think, man, you really didn't know what was going to happen. Like you really didn't. Yeah. And now it's well, this thing's going to happen, and then maybe you can enjoy the rest, right? Like we know that Georgia and Alabama and Ohio State and Michigan are going to win, but like you know, you can enjoy the rest. And so, you know, from that perspective, I think that obviously it is somewhat sad. I guess you could say that it's. Uh, that that we've lost that that perspective of having these true power power teams being in the group of five. It's going to be great because it is going to happen at some point. You think about like the Boise State win over Oklahoma and the Fiesta Bowl at the Huge. end of the 2006 season. If that's a playoff game, right? Boise State beat Oklahoma. People thought Oklahoma had a chance to win the national championship. They lose a first round game to Boise State. It's going to be great. But it is you've taken the top you skimmed the top of those teams that had the best chance to pull those upsets. And they're now in a situation where it's not going to be viewed in the same way. Next podcast, which service academies of the forties would have been helped the most, <laughs> but listen, we're done with this. We're only going back so we, listen, far. We want to, tr- we want to have the conversation about how army's dynasty in the forties was only because of proscription and the draft. Come on now. Like we can have that conversation. We're going to have that conversation. Let's do it. Uh, <laughs> we're trying. We're trying to remind you that this is an opportunity for the sport to take sort of all the best of all the things that have been out there and shed the things that have held it back in certain ways, and that w- we can get to a place where we can still have tier one superpowers, but we can provide more opportunity. We could have more teams whose peaks matter who then those peaks can turn into something more sustainable from an investment standpoint, from a long-term success standpoint. The the sport's headed in the right direction. 
And we can look back to the BCS era and say, well, it certainly was better than maybe what they had done before, but there were so many frustrations that just don't exist. But just imagine a world where we can talk about Kansas State and UCLA and Auburn in these kinds of ways, and it's not just Georgia, Alabama, Ohio State, USC all the time. So I think it's going to be good. We'll get a little more forward. We still, When we go into the past here, we want to do it for a reason. We don't just want to linger in the past. We want the past to tell us something about now because it is an exciting time to be a college football fan. And we appreciate you guys making us part of your week for now. For Shahan Jaharaja of CBSSports.com, I'm Doug Maurice, And that was the College Football Survivor Show. The College Football Survivor Show, where playoff survival is always on the line.